Well, I was thinking uh, as I was preparing this week, Dina and I were in pastoral ministry for about 35 years. Um, kind of five years ago, we kind of semi-retired, if you want to call it that. But we've had lots of amazing opportunities in different roles in pastoral ministries and church planning and all kinds of crazy stuff over the years. And one of the funnest things for me, of course, as a pastor over all those years is when somebody gets saved, they're just so stoked, you know, uh, particularly if they've come out of a life that's pretty messed up. You know, they just feel that release of the weight of sin and people talk about the chains coming off. And it's such a joy to be in the, in the you know, the birthing room. What's that called at the hospital? Um, the maternity ward, you know, in the spiritual maternity ward. A lot of times as pastors, we're right there when people are getting saved, you know. And it's just so fun to follow people and say, man, my life is so different. I don't see things the same and I want to tell everybody. It's just, it's just such a joy when you see people, you know, come to know Christ. But one of the things I've also seen in pastoral ministry over the decades is sometimes maybe six months or a year later, some of that initial kind of glow has come off. And, and I will talk with people and they'll say, you know, I didn't think it was going to be this way. I thought I was going to come to Jesus and all this stuff was going to fall away. I thought maybe my addictions or my issues or my sin patterns would go away. And, and they're kind of wondering, why didn't, why didn't this work? you know, in terms of where my life is. And so sometimes there's that kind of people come back in that situation. Uh, I've had people, you know, that have backslidden, they've been really powering with God for many years, and then they kind of got lost the plot and they go off the rails and have a walkabout in sin and, and they come back and, and they'll say to me like, you know, I wonder, was I really ever saved? Did that really take, was it, you know, was it really God in my life, you know? Um, so I think about a lot of those things and, and I love tonight because Paul addresses all of those issues tonight in the passage that we're looking at. Um, a lot of times Christians kind of wonder, after all these years of being saved, how come I still do sinful stuff? <laughs> you know, that's a fair question. John Piper says, many of us felt the need to ponder the relationship between our faith and the ordinarily daily affairs of our lives. <laughs> you know, the kind of like what I believe and how I live, sometimes those don't line up. And of course, Paul's been speaking in these first three chapters about a lot of the things we believe, and now he's really shifting gears into things of, of uh, you know, what, how we live. So this next stage gets to be very, very practical. Actually, maybe painfully practical at some points if you read the scripture ahead this week. So let me start. I'll just read. Uh, we'll do a little bit at a time tonight. 17 to 19 in the uh, latter part of uh, uh, chapter 4. Paul says, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to their hardness of their heart. They've become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed to practice every, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So I think, you know, as Paul shifts gears here from what, from what, you know, who we are to how we live, if one of the things he's saying is here, look, as Christians now, we don't want to keep living like we were living before. Our lives don't want to be the same in terms of our actions and the things we do after Christ as they were before Christ. Um, so he goes into some specific things talking about this is what our life was like before we became Christians when he talks about the you know the Gentiles in this situation. He goes through a few things. He says they're futile in mind and they're hardened in their understanding about Jesus. So futility is when you try to get something and you never get there. You know, it's the it's the rope in junior high gym. <laughs> you can never get to the bell or whatever it is. That's futility, right? Uh, I think there's a futility. Paul says in in non-believers' lives, they know there's something they need to get to, but they just never seem to get it, and they're hardened in their understanding about Jesus. So it's almost like, you know, sometimes you know, they'll see a radio or a TV show or some kind of thing, and it kind of bounces off because of the hardness in their life. Um, he talks about their hearts are hardened over time due to ignorance. So because they don't know about Christ, because maybe they haven't really understood the Word of God, they haven't understand who Jesus is, no one has gotten close enough to them that's a believer to kind of explain that or model that, there is a hardness that comes over time. And this issue of callousness comes up. Uh, they get more and more callous to God, leading to greater and greater depths of sin. 
even leading to more and more calluses. It's kind of a, a you know a bad cycle that happens. And you know if you you know came to know Christ later in life, you might recognize some of this stuff in your own life, in terms of that kind of spiral. And you know I think that God puts all of us even before we're saved with a sense of right and wrong. The Bible talks about sort of knowing. People talk about a conscience or those kinds of things. But over time, you can sear that thing. You can you can step on it and squash it so many times that that voice almost gets less quieter and quieter and quieter. Little kids, you know, little kids have a sense of right and wrong. But over time, you know, that can get quieter and quieter and quieter in a person's life. And it's like calluses, you know, for years I played guitar. I remember when I started playing guitar in junior high, you know, my fingers literally had marks for the strings. I, I, I was so passionate about learning to play. My fingers bled at some point because I just practiced so much. But over time, over hours and hours of playing, my fingers got so calloused that I could play for hours and hours and hours and it didn't really affect me. Okay, now in guitar playing, that's a good thing. But in our hearts, that's a bad thing. That callousness that develops over our hearts so that, so that really it just seems like God can't even penetrate into that um, Hebrews 3.13 says, But exhort one another every day as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, that scripture points out really what that the specifics of what that hardening is, is that continual cycle of sin and the deceitfulness, the lies that comes with that, that we buy as we you know, get deeper and deeper into sin, that br brings a callousness on our heart. Um, and then it says they're greedy for to practice every kind of impurity, give themselves up to sensuality. The thing with evil and sin is there's never enough. I don't know if you've experienced that or not, but it's just never enough. Satan is a horrible taskmaster. Mm -hmm. Jesus says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he does. And so when you see those three things happening in your life or in lives around you, recognize that's the fingerprints of the enemy, of Satan, to steal and kill and destroy. And when we start to get involved in sin, there's just never enough, you know? So, you know, someone starts down, uh, it's like a wildfire, you know? These wildfires that have been burning in the central part of the province, they don't burn out. If nobody's there, if it's in the middle, they just, that fire just eats and eats and eats and eats and eats and eats. And sin is like that. It never has enough. It's never like, well, that was good. That, okay, I'm, I'm satisfied. Maybe for a brief period of time, but it always comes back at you. Okay, you need to take another step, another, you know, another piece of this thing of, needs to come. Um, <laughs> we live on an acreage with, with uh, a lot of trees. We have a, a lot of termites in our yard uh, over the, this acreage. And I've cut beautiful trees down and out of the middle, a big hole pours out of termites. I just about jumped out of my socks. First time I did it with a chainsaw, I was like, whoa, what is this a horror movie coming out of the thing? You know, I've seen entire stumps on the property basically just disappear over time because the termites just eat them. And they don't stop. They just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. They get into your house. we got problems in one of the houses. They'll eat and eat and eat. So I think these two illustrations are basically like sin. Is It's just never, never enough. Um, you know, it's the same with any kind of sexual sin or any kind of sin. Really, he, he specifies in here a lot of every kind of impurity and sensuality. So there's a lot of emphasis on what Paul's talking about in, in sexual sin here. But you know, with pornography, you know, with someone, you've known someone that's ever gotten stuck in pornography. It starts with something simple, but it's never enough. What's the next thing? What's the next hit? What's the next level? What's the next visual? What's the next video? Um, you know, out of bounds sexuality. What I mean by it is anything that we do sexually with our bodies that's not part of God's original beautiful design for our bodies. It's always like, wow, that was a thrill, but there's more. And it's always like, what's the next thing? Well, you know, I got one girlfriend that I'm sleeping around with. What would it be like to have two girlfriends that I was sleeping around? Or, you know, I don't even want to go into this kind of talk, but you know what it means. Uh, alcohol is that same way too. What starts out as fun for a lot of people ends up being a really bad prison. Of course, we know that with drugs now is brutal, brutal drugs on the street now, which, you know, start so easy, but they get a hold of you so quickly. And it's almost like for some people, there's just no escaping because it's always more. You know, one hit is not enough. Now what's next? What's the next fix? What's more, you know? Eating disorders are this way. You know, there's just a lot of things in our lives where we see that sin is something that just takes us over. And I think what Paul's saying here is we don't want to be like that anymore. As Christians, once we come to know Christ, we don't want to live like that. We don't want to have to be chained to that downward cycle all the time of, of, of that sin in our life. 
In Romans chapter 1, if you want to turn there, Paul, it's, it's, this is one of the most sobering chapters in the whole Bible for me, but in Romans chapter 1, Paul talks about at the very beginning, the power of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of that. Uh, Justin, did you have that on your truck for a long time? Yeah. What is it, 116? Yeah. yeah, he had a secret agent 116 yeah. sticker on his truck, but I'm not ashamed of the power of gospel of, of the gospel. But then he goes into, in Romans, and he starts to address three different kinds of groups of people. Some that are straight up pagans, he starts out. And then he moves into what I call like good moral people or whatever. And then he, he, goes, <laughs> he goes to the Jews finally and helps all three of those groups say, we really need Jesus. But when you look at this first group in 16, he starts to talk in 18, the wrath of God is revealed from against uh, all ungodliness and unrighteous of men. And three times in verse 24, God gave them up. There's a releasing uh, uh, as people want to go more and more in sin and turn their more back on God. In 26, God gave them over. And now this gets the list gets scarier and yuckier and grosser and more messed up. And the third time he says, he, also you see that in verse 28, that there's this giving over of God. So this thing with sin and this downward cycle, just it just never is enough. It's never and never enough. I think what Paul is saying is in Christ now, we can get off the hamster wheel of sin. You know, we don't, we wanna, we don't wanna live like that in terms of what our lives are. So let's go on. Uh, in verse 20, now he says, but, and of course I love, you know I love the buts in scripture, but that's not the way you learn Christ. And he's got a little, uh, uh, maybe a little parenthesis, assuming that you've heard about him and were taught him the truth in Jesus. So we know that he knew this church in Ephesus well. He was there and taught for many years, but this was probably a circular letter that went to other churches. And of course, Paul hadn't been there for f maybe three or four years. So there was new people that were saved. So he didn't know everybody. So I think what he puts this in is to say, look, I'm, I'm assuming you've heard about the truth of Jesus you know, I think that's what that whole sentence is about. But um, but he says this, 22, I want you to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and do not, and and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So he's got an extended metaphor here, or a picture of clothes, you know, taking off old clothes and putting on new clothes. So he's using that as an illustration. Come at the end of a horrible work day, you know, you know, you got one of those jobs that you take a shower after work instead of before work, you know, and you're plastered and all that stuff stays on the back porch. You know, I've had days like that with my work clothes, right? Uh, it's that taking off of those old clothes and putting on those, those new clothes. And so he, he's got this sort of this picture of this. And he talks about this old self and we need to talk about this a little bit tonight because it's important. Um, there's sort of two thoughts in Christianity and people who read the Bible in terms of what this old self is. So um, old self, flesh, the old man, I don't mean that as male and female, but you know, generally for humanity. Those are all terms we talk about. Um, I guess the first kind of crew says both are alive in us as Christians and there's this mortal combat going on between the old man and the new man. I'll just use those terms because I'm used to them. But in the, so it's like there's the angel on one shoulder and the demon on the other shoulder. You know, who's who am I listening to today? You know, the, you've heard the good dog and the bad dog. Which one do you feed, right? So that's one theory about what this old nature is or this old flesh in our lives. There's another option that says, look, this old man is crucified. He's dead and he's buried with Christ at the time of our conversion. So there's kind of two ways to look at it. And I, I have grace for people who think differently about it. I spent most of my life, my Christian life, thinking option one was the way to go and was taught growing up in youth groups, you know, oh, don't, don't feed the bad dog, you know, don't, you know, let's feed the good dog, you know, and don't listen to the game, don't teach, the, you know, all that. So I, I get that. I, a lot of my life was that way. But as I started to read the scriptures and study a little more, I started to realize, you know, it actually looks like from scripture, that old person, that old flesh, that old part of who we were, actually died at our conversion. And I'll give you some scriptures because it's important to back it up. But Romans 6, 1 to 7, if you want to turn there, that's a really good one to start with. But um, Romans 6, 1 to 7. What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound? No, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, 
in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's the picture of water baptism. We saw that here a couple weeks ago. Going down, coming under, coming out. That's a picture of Jesus. It's an identification with Jesus. Verse 5, For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self, that's that same word, was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Uh, on that same topic, Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. So my opinion now is, after looking at the scripture, is that I don't think there's two, two natures battling in me. I'm not, I'm not spiritually schizophrenic as a Christian. Uh, I think that old man, that old person, that old flesh, that old way of life is actually dead in me. It took place when I received salvation and, and God poured Jesus' blood over me. It seems to me like that's now. Not everybody believes it, but I think that person is dead in our life. Um, so Paul is saying, put on this new man. And I think what he's talking about is quit acting like the old one. Get those clothes off. In, in, you're already clean inside. Take that dirty clothes off and put on those new clothes in your life. It's interesting in the New Testament area, a lot of times baptismal candidates would have take off their clothes and they would put white robes on. They would baptize them with white robes. It was a picture of this newness, this taking off of the old stuff and the, and the newness in terms of who Christ is. Um, so Paul's talking about this illustration. We, we take this off, and it's a choice. We choose to take this off, this old one off. Um, to be renewed, and I'll go down here, to be renewed uh, in spirit, I mean, verse 24, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. This word renewed is interesting. In Greek, there's different ways to spell words, and they mean a lot of different things. It's, it's a wonderful language, but this is a present passive infinitive. What that means is present. It's an ongoing process, so this renewal is an ongoing process, and it's passive. It's interesting because it means the person who the subject is is not doing the action. Someone else is doing the action to them. So if you look really carefully in your English Bibles, if you've got a pretty specific translation, it says... Um, to be renewed. That's passive language. So it's really cool, this picture, I think, even right down to the words and the way that Paul, the, the words that Paul is choosing is saying, this is something that's an ongoing thing, this taking off. It's not a one-off. We choose to do that every day. But it's not us who's making that happen. It's God who's doing that in us. So it's this strange dance between me choosing, making the choice to take that off, but then God actually, you know, making the the change take place, the power coming from him, right? And where's the battleground? We know that a lot of it has to do with our minds, uh, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And that's where it takes us a while, I think, as Christians, sometimes a long time, to get our heads around the fact that, you know, if I'm right, that we are new creatures, you know, I, I have to stop thinking like that old way. That old thing is gone in me, it's dead in me, it was crucified in Christ. And this new reality of the fact that I'm saved, I'm redeemed, I'm loved, I'm accepted, you know, all those kind of things we talked about, adopted, remember, in the first chapter that Paul was talking about all the things, he was so excited he couldn't already take a comma in his, you know, thing for like 20 verses, right? All that stuff, that's true about me. Dina has a great little thing on their fridge, just true things, you know, I'm loved, I'm accepted, I'm, you know, and, and it's good some days when you're really feeling none of those things to walk in the fridge and see that there and go, sometimes I'll stop and go, Okay, yeah, you're right. I am accepted. I am loved. You know, my Eeyore days, right? But I think that's the renewal of our minds, and that's what Paul's talking about. We put off this old self and we put on this new self because of this renewal that's taking place in our minds. Then in verse 24, he says, to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. I love that he talks about true righteousness and holiness. Anytime he says that, it makes me think, well, there must be some kind of false righteousness and false holiness. And for sure there was. You know, that in Jesus' time in the first century, there was a whole lot of professional religious people, you know, a, a great deal maybe of the Pharisees and the scribes, that had this false righteousness, that they, they, they had everything all dialed on so it looked like they lived perfect lives. 
but where it counted in their hearts or what they were thinking about was you know, dead man's bones. You, start, you whitewash the tomb, right? So there is a false righteousness that looks really like you have your stuff together, but it has nothing to do with the heart. What about false holiness? Again, they had this false holiness. They walked around in the market and said, oh, hello, rabbi, and sit in this great seat, and, you know, and I don't even talk to women, or, you know, and yet in my mind, you know, who knows what I'm doing undressing that lady or whatever they're saying, you know what I mean? So there is a, there is a false righteousness, there is a false holiness, but Jesus is talking about this new self as we put it on and as we're empowered by God, you know, through his Holy Spirit, when we make that choice, we cooperate with that, and there's this true righteousness and this true holiness that starts to come in our lives. Not a fakey outside thing, but an actual transformation in our lives. Uh, so now in verse 25, now he really shifts gears and he goes into what I call the don't do grocery list, you know? And people say, oh, Christianity is not about don'ts, you know, and, and nots. And uh, yeah, it is sometimes, you know, it is about yes and amen, but it also, he's got a whole grocery list he's going into. But don't forget we're halfway through chapter four, and for three chapters, he's been hammering on who we are, what God has done, the blessings of God, the yeses, the amens of scripture. Now he's getting to the don't do list, okay? But if you just start with a don't do list, this is, you know, Christians who've been sucking on, you know, pickles, right? Because they're never happy, and they think that that's really spiritual, right? To always have a frown on yours, because it's always don't, 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 don't. You know, that's not the essence of Christianity, for sure. It's yes in Jesus, but there are some don'ts. And I think that's where Paul's getting, he's just getting super practical now. I mean, you know, it might have been, you know, heavenly realms and adoptions and all the stuff in the first three chapters. You, oh, okay, he's getting very, very real now. <laughs> so let's go into it. Um, I think the thing I tried to think about when you see what I call grocery lists in the scripture, I'm always asking, why are they in this order? Or how can I group them to make sense in my head? And I think the thing that I kind of saw as maybe the umbrella for me was in verse 30, he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So we know as Christians, the Holy Spirit is in us, but because the Holy Spirit is a person, a personality, yes, he's God, but he has a personality, he can be grieved, he can be bummed out uh, based on how we're taking his temple around and the stuff we're sticking our fingers into and, you know, getting involved in the stuff we're thinking, right? So it, that's very powerful for me to think about, you know, what, is it, what does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit in my life? You know, the Holy Spirit is present in me. Why would I want to do that? But Paul, Paul is just saying, you know, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. You were sealed. Remember we talked about the picture of the seal, you know, early on. You were sealed for the day of redemption and the Holy Spirit is in you. So to me, that's maybe the umbrella is how can we not grieve the Holy Spirit? <laughs> And then he comes into a whole bunch of stuff we, which, we, which grieves the Holy Spirit, I think. To me, I'm saying that's the thing. So he talks about words. Words, emotions, thoughts, and actions. Those are kind of the four categories I can pull out of the grocery list here. But So let's start with words. Verse 25, he says, Stop lying to each other, for we are members of each other. Speak and tell the truth to each other. So again, that's a pattern, you know, before Christ. A lot of people learn to lie. It's effective sometimes in the world and gets us off the hook or gets us different places or keeps us out of the principal's office or whatever you want to say, right? Uh, Paul says, look, we got to stop doing that now in Christ uh, because particularly to each other, we're members of each other because we're one body. It's almost like me saying, you know, to my elbow, lying to my elbow, I'm going to stick you in the fire or some stupid thing. You know what I mean? It's all my body. Why would I lie to my body about something? Although we probably do that, but you know, Paul says, don't lie to each other because we're parts of the same body. So this is something that would grieve the Holy Spirit. Paul this is says, don't do it. In verse 29, he says, don't have corrupting talk, um, but build up and dispense grace. So don't have conversations that lead people down into sinful places or tempt them into sinful places or, or lure them into sort of the edge of the chasm to say, hey, look at that. You know, Paul talks about, you know, for the... Uh, People don't don't bring them into sin. The weaker vessel or the weaker weaker Christians don't do that. Um, dispense grace. I know you know people like that. I know you know people that every time Christians that you're around them, there's this just this grace that flows out of them. You come away feeling like, oh man, that was so blessed. I, having coffee with that person just makes my day or whatever. Right? That's a person who dispenses grace with their mouth. Um, clamor. This is like noise. Don't just make noise. Don't just you know cause a riot just to be a person who causes a riot. Don't use your 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 words in that way just to just to make a bunch of noise. You know, make it count. 
Uh, verse 31, slander. You know, slander is, is like an evil intent. I use my words as a weapon. You know, and sometimes for us, slander is pretty subtle. It's not something we say necessarily. Someone's talking about somebody and you just go, I don't know, you know, about somebody's character. or Just something that subtle can be slander, you know. Um, man, oh man, yeah, Christians over time, I think we get the big concept pretty quick. I shouldn't murder anybody anymore. It's better if I don't sleep with my girlfriend. You know, I shouldn't. You know, we get the big stuff right away, okay? But sin is sin. And Paul's going to stuff which I think this particular list as Christians, if I was to be honest about my experience as a Christian and hanging around with Christians for a long time, we're awfully rough on these things with slander, you know? And we can, we can go to war with somebody who's another Christian with our words and decimate them. And I've seen it lots in my life. It, it's happened to me and I, I probably have done it too, you know? So our words, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Then he goes into emotions. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit in our emotions. And he talks about in verse 26, um, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. So there is a right place for anger. It's hard for us to understand. I mean, as I started to understand the scriptures, I always thought anger was totally bad. There can't be any anger. But then I started to look at Jesus' life. He comes into the temple. This is supposed to be the place of prayer for the nations. It's supposed to be the bright light where the Gentiles can come and see the true reality of God. And he walks in and there's two-bit thieves, you know, buying doves for 50 cents and selling them for $50 and saying, these are temple doves and all this money changing, all this garbage goes on. And he, and he sees this and he's angry. You know, he's righteously angry. He makes a whip and he drives them out and turns that. That's anger to me. But we also know that Jesus did not sin. So he was angry in some way in that situation and did not sin. And I don't totally understand this, but there is a righteous anger in our lives. Uh, and the only thing I can sort of start to see a little bit is if I'm angry for the stuff that I want to get, <laughs> maybe that's the difference between I'm angry because there's a person who's been a woman who's been child, a child prostitute and got taken. I mean, I'm angry at that. That's a righteous anger or whatever. You know, there's, it doesn't necessarily mean that I got ripped off because sometimes anger for me is like, I want my way. But there is a righteous anger. We see things that are wrong around us. And so there is a, there is a, a righteous anger. Um, so I get angry and don't sin. And then he says, don't let the sun go down in your anger. We've had some good conversations today about that in our own house. You know, how do you do that? Particularly husbands and wives or children and parents. How do you sort that anger out so it doesn't fester? How do you not let it go overnight? And uh, a lot of people have tried to figure out, like, what, is that, what does that look like in my marriage? Or what does that look like in my children? But I know that unresolved anger, when it continues to get stuffed, it finds somewhere to go. You know, And a lot of times it's very, very unhealthy places. So uh, get angry, but don't sin. Verse 31, wrath. We don't want to be wrathful people. I think wrath is the, the desire to get even. It's like, you know, somebody's done something to me and I want them to pay. You know, that's wrath. Um, and the scripture talks about, you know, that's God's job, not our job. You know, so don't be a wrathful people in terms of trying to make somebody pay for it. Uh, malice is similar to that, verse 31. It's a desire or to or an intention to do evil. That's malice. So it's like, you know, I don't care what happens to that person. I just want them to get their just desserts. You know, even as a Christian talking like that, sometimes it's like, whoa, wait a minute. Did that just come out of my mouth, you know? Um, so, so malice, emotions. And then he talks about thoughts, okay? So it's not just about what we say, but it's what's going on inside of our head. And this is always the trick, of course, of true Christianity and a relationship with God is. He talks about bitterness in verse 31. Uh, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger uh, be away from you. So bitterness is a very powerful thing in our lives. And I do think that lots of Christians deal with this. Matter of fact, we just talked about this in church somewhere in the last couple of weeks about taking an offense or somewhere in our, and there was a, I think it was one of the preachers talking about taking an offense. But uh, bitterness, I think for me, has to do with somebody owes me something. There's this sense that, you know, you owe me something or you owe me something or that church owes me something or that job owes me something or the government owes me something or my neighbor owes me. Somebody owes me something and this bitterness just festers in our life and it gets to sort of take a life of its own. It's like we don't even want to let go of it, even if we could, because we start to harbor this bitterness and it's a real deal. Um, Hebrews 12, 15 says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. 
So again, I think these are the hidden sins of the church or the hidden sins of the Christian. He's going right after them in a very practical way. Say, don't, don't allow bitterness to take a root in your life. Sort it out, give it up, let the person, you know, whatever it is. But they probably don't care about you anymore. They're not even thinking about you, but all you can do is think about them and it eats you alive. You know, it becomes, a, becomes an infection in your heart. Um, and then, of course, actions, that's the one we always want to focus on. So if we were to say, you know, live a good Christian life, most people would start with actions. They would say, don't do this, don't do this. This is the last thing in verse 28. <laughs> he says, and he only talks about one really, don't steal anymore. You know, don't do honest work, produce wealth to share with others. So again, a lot of these people in Ephesus before the new Christ, you know, figured the shortcut way to get some dough is to steal. And of course, stealing was all part of the first century. There was all kinds of levels of corruption and government and all this kind of stuff in terms of if you had power over somebody, there's a way you could figure out to skim off some dough, you know, in that situation. Soldiers over people, politicians over, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and he says, don't steal anymore. Do honest work. I love the uh, bumper sticker. I usually see it on the back of a very jacked up, muddy pickup. It says, dirty hands, clean money. You know, I mean, this guy says, look, I'm working for this. I'm not selling drugs, right? Okay, I, I just love, I just want to go to those guys. Yeah, yeah, I love that you're working hard, right? Uh, I want to work hard. Do honest work, he says, and produce wealth so that you can share it. And this is such a, such a powerful way. So that's another way where I think Paul's saying we've got to shift gears in our actions. This is what we used to do. No, we don't want to be like that anymore. We, it's, it's good to work. It's good to produce wealth. It's good to be able to share with each other. Uh, so this is his kind of don't do grocery list. It's in the scripture. So, you know, we can't ignore it. There's a whole big list here. And I think this is really very practical for Christians because <laughs> I mean, these are the ones that trip us up more than some of the other ones that in Romans chapter one, right? Um, and then at the end, uh, he says, be kind, be tenderhearted and forgiving. Uh, he finishes up that section um, in terms of, so here's what we want to do. We want to be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God has forgiven us. So just to be kind and to be tenderhearted, man, that's a that's kind of a rare commodity now. It seems like anger is kind of growing in the culture around us, you know? I, I can't believe how many times somebody will swear in the parking lot or cut somebody off. Or, it just seems like people are angry, you know? Uh, kindness is kind of a rare commodity. It's, I don't just in my work and hanging around town, it just seems like everybody's kind of amped up, you know? And he says, be kind, be tender to each other. You don't know what that person's going through. Don't don't unload on them. You don't know what they're what why they said that or whatever. That's that's tender hardness. And then he says, forgive like for, for Christ forgave us. <laughs> Luke eighteen nineteen. This is such a great story that Jesus told. I just want to read it. If you want to go there, it's you know it pretty well probably. But Luke eighteen eighteen nine through fourteen. And Jesus told a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Of course, tax collectors were notoriously bad guys. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. He's looking down his nose, right? I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. That's what I just talked about. External, right? Right? But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. He beat his breast and said, God, be merciful on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other one. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That sense of understanding forgiveness, that I'm able to forgive other people because I understand how greatly I have been forgiven. you know. And sometimes the farther we are away from our salvation, it's hard to f remember that. The story of, you know, I've been I've been forgiven the debt of 10 gajmillion dollars and somebody owes me 10 cents and I'm on them like white on rice. You know, forgive us if Christ has forgiven you. It's just a cool reminder to go, you know what? My forgiveness account is so huge, I can write a check for this guy because of what Jesus has done in my life. So what's the take home? Well, there's a lot of them here this week probably, but the one I've been thinking about is um, and if, if you've been hanging around with me and, and Oceanside School of the Bible anywhere in the last eight years, you're so tired of me talking about the three parts of salvation. But, but I think we got to talk about it again. There, there's sort of three pieces of our salvation. The first part is I have been saved. 
uh, it's a completed work. It's what Jesus did on the cross. I accepted that through uh, through uh, faith by grace. Okay, and I've been I've been freed from the penalty of sin. That old man is dead in me now. That tendency that that. Uh, life lock grip that sin had on me, that death grip has been released in Jesus because he overcame the grave and he's overcome that in my life. So I have been saved. Every one of us is a Christian. You can say, I have been saved. But there's another part of salvation which is called sanctification, which is I am being saved. Now this is not being saved uh, from the penalty of sin. This is being saved from the practice of sin. Okay, so positionally, all those first three chapters of where I am in, in Ephesians are true in my life, okay, but I still sin. So how does that work? That's what I talk about What new Christians, a lot of times six months or a year, come later to me as a pastor, like, this is not working. They're like, no, it's, it's working fine. Jesus has done this in your life, but we need to cooperate, and they're, they're, it's like he's got to clean this stuff out of us over time, okay? So that's being saved, and, and that cooperating work in God, we're being saved from the practice of sin. And I think that's what Paul's talking about now, is he's gotten, he started the first part, all these blessings and all our position, all this kind of stuff, but now he says, look, there's still stuff to get out of our life. You don't do it on your own, that's Galatians. You know, you do it just like you did by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit. But it's still stuff that's got to get rooted out of our life. God wants to have it. You know, he doesn't want us to be stuck in our sin. He saved us from sin. Why would he be happy that we would go back and, you know, play around in the vomit? It's silly. You know, God's not like that. So we are being saved. But I think the thing that struck me was our will has a role to play in the second one, in sanctification. We can choose to cooperate with God. The putting off and the putting on, those are choice words. Those are words that we have to make a volitional choice to. Um, sanctification, this process of working out sin in our life, it's not automatic, you know? It's not like seniority in the union. <laughs> I've never been in a union all my life. It just, so I started working in the school district. And in the union, it's all about time, you know? Man, wherever you are on the seniority list, you get the good runs, you get the good stuff, you get the good times, you get the good benefits, right? And you just put your time in and you get there, right? <laughs> Sanctification is not like that. And I've seen people say, how dare you call me on that sin? I've been a Christian for 60 years. They're like, well, yeah, you just keep repeating that first year over and over again. You know, you're not, you know I don't see you really growing. And again, that, that's probably sinfulness. But, you know, so it's like, you know, um, it's not automatic. This sanctification is not automatic. The salvation and justification is complete in Jesus. Done, 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 done. Not a, don't hear me say, I need to keep trying to be saved. You are saved. But this getting out of the sin in our life, there's a choice. And I think it's almost a daily thing where I wake up. I knew I was going to teach you this tonight. I was felt so crummy. I woke up this morning and said, I choose, Lord, to put off the old and put on the new this morning. It was a choice I made. Now, I just said it out loud because I'm teaching on it. But it's not a bad way to start the day, right? But we have a choice in it. Um, Sanctification is not automatic. We choose to cooperate with God. Don't hear me. It's not us white knuckling stuff, but we have a role in it. This is what's so mysterious about this dance. God doesn't just do it automatically. He allows us to lean into Him and grow, and to Him empower us to change our mind, to say no to sin, all that stuff. Right? It's it's a beautiful thing if you think about it. Um, but I think this picture is very stark to me, and you've heard it before here at Oceanside. But why do we keep opening up the casket of the old men? An old man, and pulling out that rotting, stinking corpse. What a gross picture, you know? There's a dead body, you dig it up, you open up the casket, and you pull this gross, putrid, rotted thing out, and you dress it up with some new clothes, and you stick some makeup on to try to make it look a little better, you know, you, you prop it up so it looks like it's good, you stick a, a thing in the hand, you know? Why do we do that? But that's exactly what I think we're doing when we go back to our sinful ways. We're saying, this thing is dead, but I choose to keep playing with it and keep pretending like it's real. I think what Paul's trying to help us to say is, that corpse is dead and buried in Jesus. Quit digging it up. <laughs> Quit trying to dress it up. Quit trying to say it's there. You know, Just cooperate with God and realize that thing is dead. I don't want to dig that grave up anymore. I don't want to pretend that what is dead still lives. Because as Christians, I think when we sin, we're just pretending like that dead thing is still living. You know, we're playing with the corpse and trying to get it to look good. And I think that's the radical surgery, the, the brain surgery that Paul's doing for the book of Ephesians. And it's to, to start to get to the place where you go, how silly is that? You know, I'm thinking about doing a sin. It's like, why would I do that? 
that, that corpse is rotting and gross. Leave it in the grave. Lord, I turn my back on that Holy Spirit. Help me to walk away from that sin. You know? And now uh, that sounds very pious, and I wish I could say I do it in my life. But I know that's part of this transformation progress, this, this renewing of our mind that Paul's talking about by the Holy Spirit. So let's not play with corpses anymore. <laughs> Let me just pray. Thank you, God, for the amazing, amazing power of the gospel. You've saved us out of all the stuff we were part of. But God, I thank you. You're not just happy enough to stop there. You want it to work out in our lives, too. And thank you, God, for being such a good God. You're such a good father. You don't want to see your children hurt in sin anymore. Uh, you, you've, you've freed us from the penalty, but Lord, you're working it out. And I thank you that we can choose to put on, put on this new. God, help us to see this week, what is it, what's it like to put on the new man? Um, the, the new life in you that's created and fashioned after you. Thank you that you are such a good God and you care so deeply about us that you want us to be free in every way, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.